understand most of what's difficult. Most of the, most of the difficulty of understanding the universe lies, in, lies in, the, in the vast complexity of life. That's what really, truly impresses people. That's why people who believe in God mostly do believe in God, because they look around the living world and they see how impressive it is. So that level of Im impressedness is completely destroyed by Darwin, and Darwin, of course, doesn't explain the origin of the universe. Uh, for that, I invoke the anthropic principle and the multiverse. Less satisfying, admittedly, but science makes progress. The one thing you can be absolutely sure is that a creative designer cannot be a satisfying explanation. Dr. Lennox. The anthropic principle, as you stated, Richard, I think is a complete truism. Of course, we have to be in such and such a kind of planet of the kind that we could appear on. That does not answer the question how we came to exist on it. And I fear I have to disagree with your Darwinism. Darwinism does not explain life. It may explain certain things about what happens when you've got life. But evolution uh, assuming, assumes the existence of a mutating replicator. It does not explain how that replicator came to exist in the first place. Now, that's a major discussion. I want to address the who designed the designer question because it's the old schoolboy question, who created God? I, I'm actually very surprised to find it as a central argument in your book because it assumes that God is created. And I'm not surprised, therefore, that you call the book The God Delusion because created gods are by definition a delusion. Uh -huh. Now, I know, and I ought to explain, that Richard doesn't like people who say to him that they don't believe in the God he doesn't believe in. But I think that this is possibly touching a sore spot, because you leave yourself wide open to the charge. After all, you are arguing that God is a delusion. And in order to weigh your argument, I said that it is you who's arguing that God is a delusion. Oh, sorry. And in order to weigh that argument, I need to know what you mean by God. And if you say, if there is a God, you have to ask who created God, that means that you're reduced to thinking about created gods. Well, none of us believe in created gods, Jews, Muslims, or Christians. And I think that argument then is entirely beside the point, and you, perhaps you ought to put it on your shelf-marked celestial teapots where it belongs. Oh! be distressed by that. But finally, a word about miracles. This is a massive subject. You claim with David Hume that miracles violate the laws of nature. Well, David Hume's a very curious person to quote on this topic, because David Hume didn't believe really in the laws of cause and effect on which laws of nature are founded. He didn't believe in causality, and he didn't appear to believe in the principle of induction and so that he's not a very good authority to quote. Secondly, I do not think that miracles are violations of the laws of nature, because the laws of nature describe what normally happens. God, who is the God of this universe and created it with its regularities, is perfectly at liberty to feed a new event into the universe. Just as C.S. Lewis makes a point, if I put $2 plus $2 in my desk tonight, $4, if I find in the morning there are, is $1, I don't say that the laws of arithmetic have been broken. I say the laws of Alabama have been broken. What? <laughs> <laughs> I think the book The God Delusion gives the game away in the dedication at the front of the book to Douglas Adams. Where, where he says, isn't it enough to see that a garden is beautiful without having to believe that there are fairies at the bottom of it too? Now, you do a brilliant job at getting rid of the fairies, though it must be said that most of them didn't believe in them anyway. But when you see the beauty of a garden, say, in New College in Oxford, do you believe there's no gardener or no owner? That its sublime beauty has come about from raw nature by pure chance? Of course not. For gardens are be, to be distinguished from raw nature by the operation of intelligence. And 
what you're doing in your book, I think, is presenting us with an obviously full set of alternatives. Either we take gardens on their own or the garden plus fairies, but they don't appear on their own. They have gardeners and owners, so does the universe. You say there's no evidence of God, and yet your very description of the universe as a garden bears witness that the evidence is all around you. I broke my back. Blind faith can be very dangerous, especially if it's coupled with a blind obedience to an evil authority. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to emphasize is true whether the blind faith is that of religious or secular people. But not all faith is blind faith, because faith itself carries with it the ideas of belief, trust, commitment, and is therefore only as robust as the evidence for it. I can't speak authoritatively for other religions, but faith in the Christian sense is not blind. And indeed, I do not know a serious Christian who thinks it is. Indeed, as I read it, blind faith in idols and figments of the human imagination, in other words, delusional gods, is roundly condemned in the Bible. My faith in God and Christ as the Son of God is no delusion. It is rational and evidence-based. Part of the evidence is objective. Some of it comes from science. Some comes from history. And some is subjective, coming from experience. But the evidence is, is all important. I mean, Einstein's predictions fit in with, um, with uh, observed fact and, they, and with a whole body of theory. Whereas we only need to use the word faith when there isn't any evidence. I presume you've got faith in your wife. Is there any evidence for that? Yes, which you plenty. It? Yes. Plenty of evidence. Um, mm. I... <laughs> Let's generalize it. Never mind about my wife. Let's generalize it. <laughs>